Hey, Pastor Jeremy here. Thank you so much for tuning in to what we hope is a great tool for you to utilize and to grow you in your walk with Jesus. Now, before we get started here, we want to invite you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done that. And then also hit that notification bell so that whenever we post stuff throughout the week, you'll get notification of it so you can use that resource to your benefit, but also you can share it with your friends and family as well. And then also we want to direct you to our website at fbcac.org, where you can find out more about our church family, uh, our different ministries, and then what God is doing and, and how he's using us to impact the kingdom here in Angels Camp, California. Now, here we go. We're about to get into the word of God proclaimed. Please feel free to leave a, a prayer request or, or a comment in the section below. Thank you guys so much for joining with us today. God bless you, and we love you. I just thought, you know, I don't even need to preach a sermon anymore because uh, Janie's act of obedience preached enough to me. So if you guys are good with it, let's just go home and have lunch. Yeah? No? Okay. Not yet. Okay. Some of you are like, yes, please. Uh, Janie, again, thank you so much. That blessed my heart tremendously. So we are now in, in part 10 of the series that we've uh, been in, man, for since, what, not October. This is October, August. And uh, it's been a, a great series as we've gone through our membership covenant. This is a document that we ask our, our members to, uh, to survey, to read, to pray through, to study, um, and then ultimately to sign as a commitment, not as a legalistic tool to control, because everything in the covenant is simply a reflection of, of what God's word is commanding all of us by virtue of being a born again believer in Jesus Christ. And so again, um, none of None of the topics found in our membership covenant are extra spiritual or extra biblical, I should say. Um, they're not outside of the biblical uh, commands for Christian living. Um, they are intended, though, to kind of summarize, especially what the New Testament says about how we are to live as Jesus followers, how we're supposed to grow in our faith, how we're supposed to mature in our in our knowledge and in our walk of Jesus. And so the last few weeks, we've talked about some some things that have been pretty lighthearted. Um, maybe deep and spiritual, but not, but still kind of like they're feel-good messages, I, I guess what I'm trying to say. Um, biblical stewardship, holy living, uh, using our liberty in Christ to love one another, not judge one another, uh, to, to build each other up and not cause division. Those are like generally like feel-good messages. People could give a good wholehearted amen to that stuff, and, and that's all well. And so those, those messages are great to preach, and I'm sure they're great to, to listen to. I know they have been in my life. However, for the next two weeks, <laughs> uh, the topic at hand may not be as raw, raw positive as some people might think, but I think it's still absolutely necessary that we talk about it. Why? Because God's word addresses it time and time again. Over the next two Sundays, we're going to talk about everybody's favorite subject to talk about sin. Yay! <sighs> Praise the Lord. I know, I know. That's the second most. Sin and tithing are actually connected. We can go back. I, I can pull it up right now and I can preach. No? Okay. All right. We're going to talk about sin today. Today we're going to talk about how to deal with like personal sin because it starts there. Better start there. And then next week we're going to talk about how to deal with sin in a church uh, from a church perspective. Um, sin in the church as a family. Um, so this is how our membership covenant addresses how we are to deal with sin on a personal level. Okay, straight from scripture, just summarizing what the New Testament teaches. So if you guys can uh, read aloud this point from our covenant, it says, I covenant to do the following when I sin. Confess my sin to God and to fellow believers. Repent and seek help to put my sin to death. Okay, pretty straightforward. Um, not a whole lot there, but boy, oh boy, there's a lot to talk about uh, in, in this regard. So before we consider like how to deal with sin and, and how to fall into obedience in, in, in this area, I think it's necessary that we define sin. Okay, now you might be thinking that's a waste of time. We're all Christians in a church. We're all like-minded. We all have the same definition, the same thought process when it comes to sin, right? I don't think that's the case anymore, um, at least not as much as it maybe used to, used to be back in the day. I think 
um, because of the influence of the world, because of the influence of false teachers, um, our minds have been a little tricked and a little muddled as it, uh, as it relates to what is sin. And so I don't want to take for granted or assume that you guys and, and me, that we're talking about the same thing. I, I just, I don't want to, um, yeah, assume that. And so you'll see in your outlines kind of a blank space up top that says, what is sin? That's not a fill-in. That's, well, it's not a fill-in that I'm going to give you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a fill-in that you fill in yourself. And so maybe throughout this week, after listening to this message, seeking God's wisdom in his word, you can kind of come up with your, maybe your own working definition of what you think the scripture says about sin and, and just kind of what, how you process that, okay? Um, I would love for you to share that. Share it with a family member. Share it with your spouse. Share it with a friend. Um, uh, maybe share it with me. You can put it in the app, okay? In the church app, we have that prayer request section. Just put it in there or email me or something. Um, if you're bold, put it on Facebook. And just let the world know what you think of sin, right? Uh, whatever. But um, I would love to hear your guys' thoughts about, about what sin is after uh, this message. Um, so if you look up the definition of sin in like the Webster's Dictionary, which is sometimes where I start when I just want to define a word. I just, what is the dictionary definition? This is what the dictionary says sin is. It says it's an offense against religious or moral law. It's an action that is or is felt to be highly reprehensible. Interesting. Or it's an often serious shortcoming or a fault. So that's the dictionary definition of sin. So according to these three definitions, just to summarize, sin is just a violation of a law. That's all it is, right? Or it's something that is subjectively felt. Like if you feel it's offensive, then it's a sin. Or it's a personal shortcoming. It's just a fault, like a, a fault in your personality or whatever. And if we confine sin to just these views up here on the screen, then much of the reaction that we see in Scripture as, as far as like how God reacts to sin, it would seem unfair. Like if I were to read, especially much of the Old Testament, I'd be like, gosh, God, you're kind of harsh. Like, my goodness, easy with the 400 years and then this and that and the kill all women and children. Like, isn't that a little much, God? You see, this is the problem with many people is that their conception of sin is more in line with what the world says, Right. They see sin through these first three lenses, lenses and, it, and it distorts, it, it changes the way they see sin in comparison to how the Bible sees sin. In other words, if we just take these three definitions, and that's your definition, and I'm coming at it from a completely different perspective, you could see how we could have some miscommunication. You could see how we might have a misunderstanding of what sin really is. Uh, it's interesting, though. This is the first set of definitions. If you just go a little bit lower, uh, if you have an actual Webster's Dictionary, God bless you. Uh, for those of us who live in the 21st century, we just go online. We just Google it. Uh, but later on down the page, uh, this is the second definition of sin. It defines it as a transgression of the law of God. And a vitiated. It's a, it's a, I had to look that word up. Sorry. I know. I'm not going to pretend like I knew what that meant off the top of my head. I'm like, what is vitchy? I need a dictionary to define the word that I'm looking up to define. Uh, it's a defective. It's a defective state of human nature in which the person, the self, is estranged from God. They're separated from God. So that's what sin is in the second definition. Like It's like a lesser, maybe less common definition. But I think this is actually a little bit more in line with what Scripture says about sin. You see, sin is so much more than just a personal flaw. It's so much more than just a violation of some random law out there. It's so much more than a feeling of being offended. Sin is a transgression against God himself and against his law. And effectively, what does it do? It separates us from God. The prophet Isaiah put it this way. He says, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. Have you ever struggled with like, why is God not answering my prayer? I don't know. Maybe you have unconfessed sin in your life. And he's like, I don't, I, I don't hear you. You have all this sin. You need to repent of that. You need to get rid of it so I can hear you. You see, sin is so much more serious than we often think. 
and it has massive ramifications in how then we interact with other aspects of our Christian faith, like holiness, like Christian liberty, like stewardship, right? So all sin, no matter what it is or who it's done towards, is ultimately always done against God himself. In acknowledging and confessing his own sin of adultery, remember King David and Bathsheba, that crazy story? What does David proclaim in Psalm 51, verse 4? Against you, you only, he's talking to the Lord, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Wait a minute, he sinned against Bathsheba, he sinned against Uriah, he sinned against the whole nation of Israel effectively. No, David has right perspective. God, first and foremost, I sinned against you. You see, when God was preparing the people for Israel, Uh, uh, the people of Israel in Deuteronomy 9 to enter into the promised land, he was reminding them, hey, don't think you're about to enter into the promised land because you earned it, right? You did not earn this. You you don't deserve this. You didn't like discipline yourself and act like good people of God, and that's why you're getting into the promised land. No, you're getting into the promised land because I made a promise to your forefathers. I told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that this, this nation will be blessed because of you. So I'm keeping my end of the deal because that's what I do. I'm God, right? But he's quick to then say, but you know what? Over these last 40 years, since I've set you free from slavery, you've been stubborn. You've been prideful. You've wanted to do it your own way. And as a result, you've actually stirred up the wrath of the Lord. Isn't that an amazing reality? That in the midst of providence, God reminds his people, you still need a heart check. With respect to God, that is the only reaction suitable for unatoned for sin. It's wrath, eternal wrath. Why? Because sin is offensive to an eternal God. That's why. One of the greatest theologians and philosophers of all time, Augustine, in his collection of writings entitled The Confessions of St. Augustine, describes sin in this way. He says this, Sin comes when we take a perfectly natural desire or longing or ambition and we try desperately to fulfill it without God. Not only is it sin, it is a perverse distortion of the image of the creator in us. All these good things, the the, the longing, the desire, the ambition, all these good things, all our security are rightly found only and completely in who? In him. This is another important aspect of sin. Sin is the distortion of the imago Dei within you. We are all made and created in the image of God. And when we sin, we distort that image. And God gives us these these good desires, these good longings, these, these good ambitions. But when we seek to fulfill them in other things, that's when we sin. When I uh, counsel couples to prepare for marriage, we talk about the four basic needs of every human being. There are four basic needs that every human being needs. Janie needs it, Ashley needs it, I need it. We all need it. It's acceptance, identity, security, and purpose. Every human being, no matter how old you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what color of your skin, male or female, we all need to feel accepted. We all need a sense of identity. Who am I, right? We all need safety and security. Like, I, I, I need to know that my life is, is safe and secure in some manner. And then we all need purpose. Like, when I get up out of bed, I, I want to know that there's purpose to my life. I want to know that at the end of the day, I'm not just a product of evolution. And I'm a former monkey or something like that, right? We need to know that. When we seek to fulfill those four basic needs with money, with sex, with relationships, with uh, uh, jobs, with possessions, with the world, whatever, we fall into sin. We distort the image of God and God's design in our lives. So, you know, so often, what do we do? We, We look at sin, and I'm guilty of this, and I don't think it's guilty, it's just part of the process, but if we stop here at this step, we lose sight of what sin really is. So when I look up sin, I want to know, well, what is, how does the Bible define it? And we all know in the New Testament when it mentions sin, uh, it's an archery term, right? Anybody ever shoot a bow and arrow in your life? Okay. Has anybody missed the target? Okay. You have sinned. Okay. It's an archery term. 
I mean, I didn't hit the bullseye. I didn't hit perfection. And that's great, and that's kind of a good way to conceive sin. However, if we stop there, I think we have the tendency then to downplay the seriousness of sin. Because if you were to hit just right of the bullseye, no one would say, you're a failure. They, what would they say? Oh, man, you almost cut. That was so close. Do we approach sin that way? Like, oh, you almost didn't sin, but you did. But, man, you were so close, right? You're almost there. Keep going. Keep trying. See, I think that's the problem that we might run into if we approach sin in, in just these various manners. We make concession, concessions for sin. We, we lower the severity of sin, right? Like, of course, murder, rape, incest, whatever, that's terrible. But come on, these lesser sins, right? Everybody does it. And that's the problem is we don't see sin the same way God sees sin. D.L. Moody uh, once put it this way, and he kind of put it in poetic form, but it, he creates this great contrast. It's not going to be up here on the screen, but I just want to read it to you. He once said this, man calls it an accident. God calls it an abomination. Man calls it a defect. God calls it a disease. Man calls it an error. God calls it an enmity. Man calls it a liberty. God calls it lawlessness. Man calls it a trifle. God calls it a tragedy. Man calls it a mistake. God calls it a madness. Man calls it a weakness, and God calls it willfulness. You see, sin is serious, and it must be treated accordingly. And here's the thing. All sin is equally offensive to God. We compartmentalize for the sake of ease, for the sake of comfort, for the sake of not wanting to judge others, right? We, 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 we compartmentalize sin. I don't do these, these big ones. I'm not out there just, whoa. But I struggle with gossip. I lie. Right? I steal. I curse. I, 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 I think negative thoughts about other people. Like, we, we make concessions for those things. Why? Because everybody does it. We normalize sin for the sake of making ourselves feel good about it. And at the end of the day, God doesn't feel good about your sin. He hates it. And we should have an appropriate response to it as well. So in the rest of our time together this morning, if you're not already encouraged, uh, you're going to be encouraged. I promise by the end of this message, it will be a hoorah, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus uh, type of message. But we're going to look at just three simple things that we can do in dealing with our personal sin. And the first, as you might guess, is confession. It begins with confession. Remember that the biblical definition of, of confession is not just to admit you've done wrong. It's not saying, I know, you got me, I'm sorry, my bad. No, it's to say the same thing about the sin as God says about it, right? So if God says it's disgusting, I'm going to say it's disgusting. It's unfitting for an image bearer of God. It's offensive to the cross of Jesus Christ. It needs to be put to death. That is confession. There are far too many churches, far too many pastors. I have watched video after video of pastors who are more concerned with filling seats and making people feel good. They've actually said from the pulpit, people already know how sinful they are. They don't need to be reminded of that. My job is just to lift them up and tell them how much God loves them and he's for you. And go about your day. Then why do we still continue to struggle with sin? Why do we still continue to fall into the same trap over and over again? I don't think people are as keen to the sin in their lives as they ought to be. You see, confession does not begin with you feeling good about yourself. Yeah, you know, gosh. Oh, by the way, let me just get these out of the way. No, confession is like brokenness over the sin in your life. Towards the end of that Psalm 51, that, that's King David's lament over his sin of adultery. He writes this, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I will give it. <laughs> like, God, if there's any other way, if I could just burn a, if I could just offer to you a goat, I'd do it. Right? Could, could a pigeon take care of the sin of adultery? Please, Lord. Because if that's the case, I would give it. He goes on, you will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Darn it, I can't buy my way out of this. He says the sacrifices of God are broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. 
You see, David came at it from the right perspective. I am broken. I, this breaks my heart. Sometimes we try to fix our sins by what? Just doing good things. You guys ever do that? You ever, you ever catch your child doing something wrong and they immediately try to go, oh, I'm, I'm going to go do my chores now, Mom, right? Like we try to cover up our sin with good things. Ashley, why are you looking at your mom right now? Did that just happen? Did that literally just happen? You're telling me I'm a prophet. I'm psychic? Oh, my gosh. Praise God. I've been waiting for that. No, I'm not. Just common experience, I guess, right? We can't do that. Imagine going into a court of law and you've just, you've just committed a crime, you just broke a law, and you stood before the judge and said, and the judge says, you're guilty of this, here's your sentence, and he's like, I know, but just real quick, judge, I helped an old lady across the street, right? I, 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 I served breakfast uh, in bed to my wife this morning. Doesn't that, doesn't that count for anything? I did all these good things. He would be a terrible judge if he said, you know what? you know what, you're right, you've done a lot of good things. I'm going to absolve you of this crime. He would be a terrible judge. We'd look at that guy and you're like, you are you're ridiculous, right? The same thing is with God. Sin has got to be dealt with one way or another. And when we try to fix our sins by our good deeds, I think God laughs at us. Are you serious? You think that's why I sent my son on the cross? Ridiculous. The act of confession then continues. After the brokenness of one's heart. Why? Because you've broken God's heart. Confession continues in acknowledging the fact that, you know what? I'm going to do it again. And God knows I'm going to do it again. I'm going to sin again. Whether it's through the, you know, we like to categorize sin. There's sins of commission, right? Things you do, you actively say, do, or think that hurts the heart of God. Those are sins of commission and then sins of omission. Things you don't do. Like refusing to do good. Refusing to do things or think things or say things that are pleasing to God. Whatever that is, we have to recognize, man, we're in this together, and we're going to continue to fight this battle this side of heaven, right? And so 1 John chapter 1 and those verses 6 through 10 kind of will help put all of that into perspective. So if you're with me there in 1 John, uh, you can read along with me in your own Bible. It'll be up here on the screen as well. The, the Apostle John who wrote the Gospel of John, uh, he writes this. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. He goes on. If we say we have no sin, oh boy, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is the word of the Lord. You see, John is characterizing two kinds of lives. The life of sin, the life of unconfessed sin, um, and just rejecting the fact that I sin and I'm, I don't want to confess it. That's walking in darkness. And he says, those who walk in the light live lives of holiness, not perfection, but just being open, confess, confessing your sins when you do them. And the point is this, the, the contrast is this, you can't do both. And I think I'm, I'm right here with you. We try to literally, without maybe acknowledging it, we try to live one foot in both lanes. I want to walk in my darkness because hey, it feels good. It's comfortable. Everybody else does it. But I know I'm a Christian, and so I shouldn't. And so we teeter that line, right? Like we go back and forth, and I think we fool ourselves. We cannot walk in the light of Christ and walk in the darkness of unconfessed sin at the same time. We must continue to walk in the light as he is in the light. Otherwise, what does God call us? You're a liar, and the truth is not in you. Like God does not hold back. He's not here to please people. He's here to be real and honest with us. And John is uh, characterizing this, this differentiation that we must kind of conceive of if we're going to be able to rightly deal with our sin. So if we confess our sins, then we are truly children of God who does what? We walk in the light. And why? Why do we walk in the light? Because my confession made me a good person? Oh, look at you. You're so holy. You confess. No, it's the fact that the blood of Jesus covers me and my confession in him. That's what makes me right. It's not my confession in and of itself. Again, in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just 
to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is an ongoing process. Isn't that good to know that I can come to God the thousandth time in confession and he says, I am just and I am faithful to forgive you of your sins. You see, our confession and our agreement with God about our sin, it accesses the already established propitiation for our sin, the, the provision of the removal of sin and the gaining of his righteousness. It's already there. It's been completed on the cross. There's nothing else we need to do but confess and come under the grace of God. We cannot simply just slide our sins under the rug and pretend like they never happened, because that's another way. We either try to work our way out, or we just conveniently ignore, like, we'll just not talk about that, right? I know that was an ugly part of my life. That was before I was saved, right? It's like, that was yesterday, dude. Like, what are you talking about? Like, before you were saved. We have to be honest. We have to be open about our sins with God if we want to experience his grace and his forgiveness in our lives. And with that said, there's another aspect of biblical confession that is pointed out in the covenant, that is talked about in scripture, but we forsake. And the reason why we forsake this is because it's uncomfortable. It's embarrassing. It's shameful for some of us. Maybe we're afraid to be this real and transparent with ourselves and with each other, but it's confessing our sins to one another. That is crucial to experience the fullness of God's grace and forgiveness in our lives. Most of us are pretty good about confessing our sins to God. At least I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that's the case. That you go into your prayer time and you, can, and you just openly confess your sin to God. Unabashed, unashamed. But how many of us practice the regularity of coming to another brother and sister in Christ and confessing your sins to them? That's a whole other story. And yet I believe this to be maybe the only way that we can experience the fullness of healing and God's forgiveness in our lives. James wrote a letter to the early church, and in his letter he addresses this ongoing effect. Uh, it, it, was, it was being observed that there was this, these ongoing effects of unconfessed sin in the church. And so in James chapter 5, beginning in verse 13, we read this. And he asks these great questions. Is anyone among you suffering? And I would imagine like people are like, I'm suffering right now, right? I don't know about anybody else, but I'm suffering. Let him pray. And then, is anyone cheerful? Absolutely. I'm cheerful. Well, let him then sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Well, what are we supposed to do? If there's not prayer, if it's not praise, what do we do? If anyone is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Isn't that interesting? They don't go to the doctor. They don't go to psychiatrists. And God bless doctors and psychiatrists. Like, don't get me wrong, they're necessary. But what is the first thing that they, they're telling the church to do? Christian, go to your leaders. Let them pray for you. Let them anoint you with oil. You got a whole jug of cooking oil in the back. No problem. We'll get down. Right? We'll get to cooking. Cook that sin right out of you. No, I'm just kidding. That's very interesting. Verse 15, he goes on and he says this, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, look at that. He's connecting sin to sickness. Isn't that interesting? Most scholars believe he's definitely talking about like some kind of physical ailment. There's, some, there's something physically, war, like whole, it's a physical sin or sickness. And John is making the, or James is making the assumption and if you have uncommitted, if, you, if you've unconfessed sin in your life, if you've committed sin, and maybe this is connected to that, he will be forgiven. Verse 16 is kind of the kicker. Here we go. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Why? That you may be healed. Healing comes only after confessing of sins to one another and to praying for one another. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. You see, the reality is that sin affects every aspect of our lives. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, it wars within us, right? Stress is one of the biggest killers in the world today. And so much of our stress and our worry is connected to what? Sin. To all my worry warts, if you're a parent, you worry. 
For all of us who worry, worry is a sin. It's not trusting in the sovereign will of God in your life. We all do it. We want to minimize it because we all do it. But it's sin. You want to, you want to, you want worry and stress to just wear you down, right? We all know the effects of that: heart attacks, heart disease, all kinds of crazy stuff. Many of our ailments, according to what James has seen, and I think it's fair to say what we may see and, and experience in our lives, many of our physical ailments could be. Now, hear me when I say that: could be. I'm not saying guaranteed because James doesn't say that. But it could be connected to unconfessed sin in your life. It could be the fact that you have not let this go, and this is now manifesting itself physically in your life. And there is no other way to get rid of that than to confess your sins to others. This has been my story. I'm a product of James 5.16. Many of you know for nearly 20 years, I struggled with an addiction to pornography. It was rampant in my life. From the old, little old age of, I don't know, I probably started adolescent, junior high. For 20 years, pornography had a grip on my life. And as a good Christian, what do we do? We do everything we can to get rid of it. We go to church, we pray, we read our Bible, we serve, this and that. And I tried everything I could to get rid of this, praying to God, God, would you please Take this from me. I can't deal with this anymore. And I'd be good for a day. And then the next day comes. And it's just that cycle for 20 years. The one thing I never did was I never told anybody. And why didn't I tell anybody? Well, you know why. Because it's and that's embarrassing. That's, that's shameful. Wait a minute. You're this good Christian kid that goes to church all the time. And you talk about Jesus. And yet you're, you're addicted to pornography. Like that's, how does that work? And so I, I could never bring myself to tell anyone. I never told my family, my friends, no one. Until by God's grace, because he knows me better than I know myself, and he knows what's good for me, he arranged particular instances in my life just right so that I had no other option than to tell someone. And I just remember on a Saturday morning early, like 8, 9 a.m. in the morning, I walked into my pastor's office, and for the first time I told another human being, I'm addicted to pornography, and, it, and it's killing me. And in that moment, I'm not kidding you, in that moment, and in the days and weeks to follow, I found the freedom that I've been praying for for 20 years. Praise God. Why? Because I just walked in obedience. I didn't try to second guess it anymore. I just said, you know what? If I'm, if I'm really about Jesus, I'm going to follow his word. You see, the father of lies wants to keep you in your sins. He wants you to shut up about it. Why? Because it's in the darkness of unconfessed sin that he can do his best work. To build that shame and that guilt and to lie to you, they won't understand. If you tell anybody, they're going to turn their back on you. If you confess this to your pastor or to someone you trust in the church, you know what? They're going to start a rumor mill and they're going to kick you out. They'll think less of you. They won't understand. Guys, those are lies from the pit of hell. There is no place for that in the mind of the child of God. But what do we do? We buy into those lies, and then we put on the church facade. You guys ever do the church facade? The mask, the Christian mask? You guys don't know what the Christian mask is? Yeah? Yeah? I just had a heck of a week in my sin, glorying in my sin. 10.30 Sunday morning, whoop. Christian mask. Hey, how you doing, brother? I'm too blessed to be stressed. You know. Hey, man, I'm a child of God. Not today, Satan. And I go about my day. Not to think that, you know, not to talk about the fact that, oh, I was looking at something inappropriate last night on my computer. Oh, oh, I was at the bar last night just having the time of my life. We won't talk about that. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. You know, I'm good. We put on that facade, and now church is now filled with a bunch of fake people who we all know we're struggling with sin one way or another, but we just can't open up to one another about it. I had a discussion with my fam a family member of mine, of mine many, many years ago. This was like when I first started coming to this church and kind of just experiencing life in a smaller church. They come from some big, huge mega church in Southern California, multi-campus, thousands of people. And my family member and I were talking about the culture of our church. And we were, I was talking about, yeah, we counsel our own people. 
like they come in for counseling and we sit down with them and we talk with them and we hear them out and we live life together in that manner. And, and my family members are like, you do what? How, how does that work? Because she's thinking, how could I go to church on Sunday knowing that my pastor knows how sinful I am? That's embarrassing. He'd treat me different. How, how does that work? But when I read the scriptures, when I look at the picture of church in the New Testament specifically, that's the only picture I see of church, of people just coming. I, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm just going to be real with you. I'm going to confess my sins to you. Interestingly, the, the motto for their church is real with God, real with ourselves, and real with others. Isn't that interesting? That in a church culture that that promotes realness. Now, I, this is not a condemnation on a church. This is really a, just a, a commentary on how individual Christians struggle with being real. Real. They have the t-shirts and everything. Real with God. Real with ourselves. Real with others. But I'm not going to tell anybody about my sin. Right? That's, that's too real. <laughs> now, we need to use wisdom. Hear me when I say this. We need to use wisdom in who we confess to. Okay? I can't confess my sins to everybody. That would be too much for you to handle, right? You can't confess all your sins to everybody in the church. They may not have the spiritual or the emotional maturity to handle it, to know what to deal with it, right? Um, maybe they're struggling with the same thing you're struggling, and they might encourage you not knowing uh, what you're dealing with or how you're handling it. And so we need to use discernment. Um, when we when we share and when we confess our sins to one another, but it's still inevitable. We we must do this if we want to experience this level of healing from from sin in our lives. You see, when we confess our sins to un, to others, the bondage of sin is broken. We just sing, "Amazing Grace, my chains are gone." Those chains get broken when you surround yourself with other brothers and sisters in Christ who love you in spite of your sin, who love you and just say, I know, man, yeah, we're going we're gonna to work on that. We're going to put that to death. I agree. That is ugly and it needs to get out, but man, I love you. I want you. I want to be in relationship with you. When we confess our sins to those who are more mature in the faith, maybe even, maybe even stronger in their, in their walk with Jesus, we, we, um, we experience the reality of the, the, the prayer of a righteous person. There are those in this church who would love to just partner with you and pray for you. My job is to not condemn you. My job is to help you through. Let me just pray for you. Let me seek God's healing in your life. Why? Because the, the prayer of a righteous person has great power, not just in the end, but as it's working. That's a beautiful picture. Honesty and transparency is key in growing deep, meaningful relationships with God and with one another. And so I just want to encourage you guys, be open and find that person who you trust, no doubt, that you can confess your sins to. This is just an encouragement. Let go of whatever keeps you from doing that. It, I know it's pride because I struggle with it. I know it's shame because I've struggled with that, right? I know it's fear. That is a scary thing to do, to be able to trust someone to that extent. But boy, when you let those things go, the freedom that you can experience is unimaginable. This is um, connected to then the next step, and that, and that is repentance in your outlines. Repentance. Believe it or not, confession was the easy part. <laughs> After all said and done, confession is the easy part. Uh, repentance is the difficult part because it's actually putting your faith into action, right? Remember, Jesus never said, confess for the kingdom of God is at hand. Peter or Paul, when they were building the early church, never said, confess and believe in the gospel. What did they say? Repent. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel that you may be saved. You see, confession is a change in mind. Repentance is a change in behavior, which is an actual more truer expression of your change in heart and mind. As we've mentioned in the past, repentance is walking in one direction, stopping, confessing, and walking in the opposite direction. And it's this intrinsic combination of confession and repentance that pleases God. It actually accesses his grace in our lives. Proverbs 28, 13 says this, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. 
We've all been there. We've all covered up our sin. I don't want to talk about it. It's too embarrassing. But he who confesses and forsakes them, what? Will obtain mercy. Confess and forsake. Confess and repent. Repentance is not, though, here's the thing. Many people think, okay, repentance is trying not to sin. I'm going to discipline my body so as not to sin. I'm going to try my hardest to resist sin. Let me tell you what that works for 20 years. It gets you nowhere. It gets you absolutely nowhere. We cannot fight to not sin. That is not repentance. Repentance is putting our sin to death and walking in the newness of life in Christ Jesus. Paul writes this in Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You see, there's a difference between actively pursuing sin to put it to death. Like, I'm going to put this to death. I'm going to confront it. Rather than, ah, oh, get away. I'm going to try to avoid you as much as possible until I'm weak and until I'm alone. And then all of a sudden, oh, I'm easy game once again. Right? We have to actively put sin to death. Christ died so that we can live freely in the confession of our sin to God and our confession to each other. And so through the power of the Holy Spirit, um, we must die to these earthly desires, these fleshly desires that still war within us. Um, many of, of Paul's letters are marked by kind of this progressive thought uh, throughout the letters. So he'll begin a letter with like theology. This is who Jesus is. This is what he did. And then he'll move into like, this is what it offers you and me um, as a result. And then lastly, he'll kind of move like, so this is now what you do in response. Okay. It's kind of just this progressive logical way that Paul writes his letters. And, and Colossians is a perfect example. Colossians chapter 1, he establishes that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He is the only one through whom we are reconciled to this holy God. And then in chapter 2, he says, um, don't let anyone deceive you or lead you away from this doctrine. And then in chapter 3, this is his encouragement. Okay, because this is true, because you have new life in Christ, this is how you're supposed to act. In chapter 3, he says this. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And now he's going to list some sins that were like, oh, man, I've been there. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Like, that should make us tremble. Like, these aren't silly little things, right? These aren't things to sweep under the rug. No, they, they are earning the wrath of God. He, co he continues and he says this, if, that, if that's not humbling enough, in verse 7, in these you too once walked when you were living in them. Oh, thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. Thanks for the brutal reminder that I was once there. But that's good. We must remember that if we're going to embrace God's grace. And he goes on, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Verse 9, do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Quit walking as children of darkness. You're not that anymore. Put it to death. Put it away. Walk in the newness of life. Walk in the light, child of God, right? Again, these lists are not meant to be exhaustive, but rather an acknowledgement that sin comes in a lot of ways, right? Sin comes in a, a lot of forms. Much of them are familiar. Why? Because we all used to be there. We all used to do that. None of us have the right to say, oh, I'm so holy. I don't even, I can't relate to your sin. I don't know what that was like. I was born a Christian, right? None of us can ever say that. We need to confess our sins. We need to see to it that we remove these things from our lives. And we need to actively put to death that which earns God's wrath. And walk in the fullness of his grace and his mercy and his love. And as we put to death these earthly, fleshly deeds in which we once walked, we begin to walk in the fruit of the Spirit, right? That's what we talked about a couple weeks ago in our, in our talk with holiness that Derek talked about, right? You're either going to walk in the flesh or walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Walk in the fruit of the Spirit. And as that fruit grows, the more and more my sin will become a part of my past and not my present and certainly not my future. This is kind of that picture of sanctification that we all need to go through. 
And then lastly, to wrap it up, we, we confess, we repent, but we need to remember the context in which we do both. And it's third in your outlines. Fellow, everybody say it with me. Fellowship. This is the context in which confession and repentance need to flourish. Fellowship with God. Fellowship with one another. Whenever we talk about, whenever we, we see these kinds of things in, in, as commands in the New Testament, they are not given to individual people. They're always given to the church. It's always assumed that we're going to do these things in the context of what we're doing right now, that we're living life with one another, the good and the bad aspects of it, right? When we emphasize that, we're pr prioritizing within ourselves honesty and transparency, that which God created in us from the very beginning. Think about this. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, sin entered into the world for the first time, what was the immediate effect? They were ashamed because they saw, oh, I'm naked. That is not to be understood as just they recognized their physical nakedness and so they were ashamed. No, it's because for the first time, they were seen as they really are. All their flaws, and it caused them shame. And what did they do? They went to cover up. Cover me up, God. That's very interesting. Sin causes us a great deal of shame. It causes guilt. It causes anger. It causes resentment. And as a result, what do we do? We divide. We separate. We go into isolation. In effect, we cover up. Because that's just kind of our natural inclination. We refuse to let people in. But remember what 1 John 1, 7 says. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When there's a biblically faithful approach to sin through confession and repentance, we're more apt to experience this true fellowship with one another. Um, that is the picture of the church, being transparent with one another, right? It's that Greek word that we're all experts on by now. It's that Greek word koinonia, right? It's that partnership. Church is a partnership. It's a participation. It's a fellowship of like-minded people saying, yes, we are all sinners saved by grace. Let's just be open about it. Let's not try to fake it till we make it, right? Let's not be those fake Christians anymore. You see, sin is so deceptively dangerous because, it, it, because of its effects in, a, in destroying fellowship, sin always divides. It always separates. It separates us from God, and it separates us from one another. But something beautiful happens when we as a church refuse to buy into those lies that no one will understand. The lie that, oh boy, if I tell them I'm going to be treated differently. That lie that they're going to hate me, that they're going to think less of me. That lie that, yeah, I know we're all fellow sinners, but man, if, if that fellow sinner can't love me, then how can a holy and just and perfect God love me? I doubt that'll happen. Those are lies from the pit of hell. They have no place in the body of Christ. And after Paul's inner battle with his own sin in Romans 7, I love, if you, if you want to really relate to the Bible, read Romans chapter 7. It is phenomenal. Um, he, can, he comes to this honest confession that I am a wretched man. Sin continues to war within me. I do what I know I shouldn't do. I don't do what I know I should. I'm a wretched man. And then he asked the question that we have all asked at least once in our lives. Who can save me from this mortal body? Where's my hope? Who's going to get me out of this? And his immediate response was just beautiful. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks be to God that Jesus is the answer. You see, if, what, if we confess our sins, he is just and he is faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this is then the, the reminder that the Holy Spirit gives Paul as he comes out of this confession. And I think this is the encouragement that the Holy Spirit has for you today. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. You are not condemned. That is the beauty of the gospel. There is hope for me and there is hope for you. When we confess and when we repent of our sins, we put to death 
the law of sin and death that once separated us from God. Think about that. Every single one of us, for a significant portion of our lives, was eternally to be separated from God. None of us were born into this family. We were once rebellious sinners who earned God's wrath. But because Jesus died on our cross, and because we put our faith in him alone to cover our sin and to be an answer for the, the sin that still wars within me, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And now we get to walk in the freedom of Christ and enjoy uninhibited fellowship with him. For true freedom with him and true freedom with one another. That's the, that's the whole goal. And when there's that kind of fellowship in a church, I know for a fact the bondages of sin and shame weaken more and more. It just becomes no part of the culture anymore. Why? Because we're helping one another put that sin to death. We're no longer trying to do it on our own. I think for, for too long we've been trying to just do it on our own. Oh, I'll get it together. No one needs to know. Well, how long has how well has that been working out for you? Didn't work well for me, right? We're not allowing for sin anymore. We're not making uh, concessions for sin. Why? Not because we don't want to like. Not because we want to hurt people's feelings. I mean, we're not out here to beat you up, but at the same time, we cannot make concessions for sin. There is no place for that in the church. That's what we're going to talk about next week. But it creates a culture in which we're just lovingly holding each other accountable. We're not condemning one another, but through God's grace, we're spurring one another on. I know you fell. Come on, let's get back up. Let's put it to death. You can do this. Christ is in you. Right? And through God's grace, we become everything that he wants us to be. We become more mature in Christ. We encourage one another towards holiness and walking in the freedom of grace. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation in this church because this is Jesus Christ's church. It's his. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. This is a place of grace. Amen. This last point um, did not make it up here on, on the uh, slides, but it is in your outlines. And it's just kind of the, the summation. This deserves a whole other sermon. If you guys want, I can preach on it, but I'll just give it to you. You can, <laughs> you can chew on it throughout this week. Chew on it, brother. Get the donut out of your mouth and just chew. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Sorry, man. Oh, gosh. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I confess my sin to you. Thank you, brother. Okay. See? Transparency 101. There you go. See, it's that easy, right? There's no condemnation. This is the life point. The way I see my sin determines the way I see God's grace. This has been a fact of my life. It's scripturally uh, grounded. Uh, the way I see my sin determines the way I see God's grace. And this is what I mean by that. If I think little of my sin, I'm going to be more inclined to think little of God's grace. Because what did he save me from? It's not that big of a deal. I'm generally a good person. Thank God for his grace, but whatever. But if I see the gravity of my sin, that it is disgusting, that it's offensive to the heart of God, that it offends him and his son Jesus and, and the, the cross and everything that has to do with that. And then I think of God's grace. Whew, he loves me that much? Does he know what I did? Yeah, he knows what you did. He knows what I did, and he still chooses to love me. He still gives me his grace and says, come on, son, I know you're a knucklehead. I love you anyway. Come on, confess your sin, repent of it, and let's put that to death. And so as members of First Baptist Church of Angels Camp, we are all encouraged now, hopefully, to confess our sins, to get rid of it, to be open with God, and to be open with one another, to... to to partner with each other, fellowship with one another, to put our sin to death and to walk in the light, to walk in the freedom and to walk in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.